When you're undertaking calculations, sometimes it's in a pressure situation, like in an exam or when you're calculating a really important result. Or maybe you're just using an equation you've never used before. But whatever the reason, in situations like this it can be really useful to sanity check your calculation to see whether the bits you've plugged into the equation will actually produce an answer with the right units. Or other times, maybe you'll need to work out what the units of the answer you've just calculated actually are. So grab a cup of tea and a biscuit, and I'll take you through it. So let's start with a simple example. Hopefully, this is an equation that you'll recognise from school, where s equals ut plus a half a t squared. This equation is the one you'd use to calculate how far something would travel assuming that it starts with a given speed and then accelerates linearly for a given time. So in the equation, s is the distance travelled, u is the initial speed, t is the time, a is the rate of acceleration, and this final t is also the total time, but this time squared. And so now we can start to think about the units associated with each one of these variables. So let's assume here that we're going to calculate everything in SI units. So the distance then will be measured in metres, speed in metres per second, time in seconds, and accelerations in metres per second per second, or metres per second squared. And then the units of this t squared component at the end will be seconds squared. In this first part of the equation, where we've multiplied u by t, then the units will be combined in the same way, so it'll be metres per second multiplied by seconds. And then in the second part of the equation, this half coefficient has no units, so we'll ignore that. And then the other units go together as metres per second squared multiplied by seconds squared. Now we can go through and cancel out the common parts of these fractions. So in the first half, the seconds cancel, and in the second half, the second squares cancel. So the first part of the equation ends up with the unit's metres, meaning that it calculates a distance, and the second half of the equation also ends up with units of metres, so it's also just another distance. So what this equation actually calculates for is two distances, which we then sum together to give us the complete distance travelled. But more importantly, the units on both sides of the equation match. So what this shows us is that if we combine speed, time and acceleration together correctly, we can use them to calculate a distance travelled. And it tells us the units that that distance will be calculated in. In this case, that's coming out as metres. In the second example, we'll see how the same process works for a more chemistry-specific equation, the ideal gas law. In this equation, P is the pressure, V is the volume, N is the number of moles, R is the universal gas constant, and T is the temperature. So let's see how we can use this equation to calculate what the right unit should be for R. And the first step then is to rearrange the equation to solve for R. And now let's think about what units each of these parameters would have. So the pressure we could measure in pascals, and the volume in cubic metres, the number of moles would just be the number of moles, and then we could measure T in Kelvin. Then, to calculate the units for R, we simply follow the same algebra for the units as we would do for calculating the value. And that we can write either like this or like this.
So by following through the ideal gas law, we've predicted that the units for R should be pascals meters cubed per mole per kelvin. Now let's see if that's actually correct. We could of course check this in a library, but the risk of going to that section in most university libraries is that you end up dodging pairs of physical chemists and chemical physicists orbiting each other in vortices of fatal attraction that only end up when they finally collide and are annihilated, converting their combined mass as untold quantities of sexual magnetism. So instead, we'll look it up on the internet. At least we don't have to worry about any of that nonsense on here. So over here on the right, there's a list of gas constant values provided in a variety of different units. And you can see this second entry has exactly the right units for what we would need based on the inputs to our equation, albeit the units are shown in a different order. But if we'd used different units of pressure, volume, quantity of gas, or temperature in our calculations, then we would also have had to use a different version of the gas constant, one that was available with the correct units, or the equation just wouldn't work. The other really important thing to remember is that if you have an entity with compound units, like we have here for R, then from these units alone you know at least one formula that you could use to calculate that entity. So in this case if I want to calculate R and I know that R has these units, then I can derive the ideal gas law from it. To do this, the first step is to change the individual units back to the normal symbols for the parameters that they represent. And that looks like this. Then, if you prefer, you can convert the exponent view back to the normal fractional view, like this. And then it's just a simple rearrangement that leads you from that back to the normal version of the ideal gas law. Other examples where this approach work includes speed, where you might be writing that in terms of meters per second or kilometers per hour. Another example is pressure, which you write in terms of newtons per square meter. And then finally, that old chemistry favorite, concentration, which we write in terms of a variety of units, like milligrams per liter, or moles per litre, or micrograms per kilogram. The important thing is that all of these units are giving us the equation required to calculate that quantity. The units of speed tell us that we need to measure some distance and the time taken to cover that distance. The units of pressure tell us we need to measure some force and the area over which that force is operating. And the units of concentration tell us that we need to measure a quantity of something which is then dispersed in a larger quantity of something else. So for all of these examples, providing we can remember the units the answer should be in, then that gives us a clue as to how we should calculate the answer. Finally, let's look at the same approach when it comes to using dilution factors for calculating solution concentrations. Let's imagine we've taken an aliquot from the stock solution in flask 1 and have then diluted that up to the mark in a second flask. You'll know from having watched my previous videos on calculating concentrations that you can calculate the concentration in the second flask if you know the concentration in flask 1 and the dilution factor between the two solutions. So let's have a think about the units involved with all of these parameters. For this example, we'll assume the concentration in flask 1 was measured in milligrams per litre. And so in the absence of any unit changes, the concentration in flask 2 should be measured in the same units. <laughs> 
But given those two parts of the equation, what units should the dilution factor then have? Well, let's see what would happen algebraically if we tried to use the dilution factor with the unit's litres. So now, if we combine the two parts on the right-hand side of the equation, we end up with milligrams per litre multiplied by litres, but then we can cancel the two litres. And that means the equation would end up being written as milligrams per litre on the left-hand side equals just milligrams on the right-hand side. And we know that can't be right. So let's try a different approach then. What if we tried calculating using a dilution factor that had the units milligrams? Well, in that case, the right-hand side of the equation would have two sets of milligrams on the top side of the fraction, and we'd end up with the units milligrams squared per litre. And that also doesn't balance as an equation. In fact, the only way this equation works is if the dilution factor turns out to be unitless. But then, how does the dilution factor end up with no units? To work that out, we have to remind ourselves about how the solution was made. So we took an aliquot of solution 1 through the pipette, and then put that into the second flask and diluted up to the mark. So if V1 was the volume of the aliquot put into flask 2, and then V2 is the final volume of flask 2, then the dilution factor associated with that dilution process is V1 divided by V2. Because here we have the ratio of two volumes, if those two volumes are measured in the same units, then the units will cancel and the dilution factor ends up being unitless. So the two important things to notice here are that providing you measure the aliquot volume and the flask volume in the same units, when you calculate the dilution factor, that will end up being unitless, which is what you want. And then when you multiply that by the original concentration, that means the final concentration you will get for the second flask will end up having exactly the same units as the initial concentration. So the point of this video is that the units associated with the parameters involved in any scientific equation are an important part of the calculations themselves. If you put the units through the same algebra that you put the numbers through for calculating the result, then you can calculate the units that your result will have. Or alternatively, you can sanity check that you're putting values into an equation with the right combination of units to permit you to calculate the output that you want. I find this is a very useful trick that I end up reusing time and again whenever I'm doing calculations, so I hope it's useful to you too. As always, thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you want to get updates when I post other videos.